good. <laughs> and thanks for w willing to chat today. I, I really appreciate the, the chance to talk. Oh, glad to do it. It's a great, it's a great topic. Yeah, it's really good. So do you want to go ahead and jump in and we can start talking sure, about Sure, sure. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll put myself in your hands and uh, you, you let me know where you want to go and when you want to go there. Okay, sounds good. Well, I thought we'd start off by talking a little bit about the, the most recent um, connection with, with John and uh, writing the forward to the re-release of Tears of Silence, which I understand is coming out in October. Uh, but yeah, that's what it says on Amazon now. Yeah. Well, it, it, Tears of Silence um, is an old book. I think it was originally published in the 70s. Um, and I didn't, it's actually a book that I did not know until um, Jean asked me to write the foreword. In fact, there's a funny story that goes with that. Um, the, the, literally, the, the day before I got this handwritten note from Jean Vanier, uh, I had I had said to Sharon, my wife, um, you know, I'm just never going to write another forward. Um, <laughs> I get asked to do that a lot, uh, and it's it's a lot of work. You have to read a whole manuscript. You have to, you know, think um, about it in a way that allows you to write something that doesn't simply repeat what the author is saying in the book. And I've just gotten to the point where uh, taking on an assignment like that is is not something that I can um, just whip off. So I had said to Sharon, I'm, I'm just not going to do that anymore. No more forwards, uh, um, having written maybe 25 or 30. And the next day I get this handwritten <laughs> note from Jean Vanier, who is you know, one of the very few people on the planet <laughs> for whom I would break such a vow, <laughs> and I, I showed it to Sharon, and I said, "God really has a sense of humor. <laughs> you, know, you just have to you yeah. have to give God credit for for knowing a good joke." So, of course, I, I said yes. Um, Jean Vanier has long been a hero of mine, and as usual with with Jean's writing. Um, this is a, a very simple and straightforward book. I, I think that's one of Jean's great strengths. Um, he simply doesn't complexify uh, topics that, um, uh, that need to be kept right on the ground. He doesn't over-intellectualize them. He just speaks right from the heart. Uh, in, this, in the case of this book, about the invisible people in our society or the discounted people, the marginalized, the dismissed, uh, those who in biblical language are the least among us, and um, does a beautiful, beautiful job of it. And in this new edition of, of Tears of Silence, uh, his Jean's words are accompanied by photographs. I don't know the photographer, but I've seen a little bit of his work, and it's it's really really beautiful stuff. So, I was very happy to to write the the foreword, and began by telling the story of um, a woman I met years ago, who had a daughter with a severe developmental disability, um, and how this woman who who loved her daughter deeply and who who basically lived two two lives she had to do everything for herself as well as for her daughter um, gave me the the great gift as she gave everyone she came in contact with the great gift of um, of not caring about who we were in worldly terms she cared nothing about one's role or one's status or one's productivity. She had simply learned uh, through her daughter to see the essential humanity in everyone she met. And of course, that's what we all yearn for, mm -hmm. to be um, accepted, embraced, loved, affirmed for who we are rather than what we do. 
Um, and and so that story seemed like the perfect place to begin this forward because that that vision, uh, those eyes for the essential humanity in every person is is one of the great gifts that Jean Vanier and Larish bring bring to the world as well. So I'm glad I broke my vow, um, but if anybody's thinking about asking me again, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. let it be known. <laughs> I'm, I'm not writing anymore. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And how is it that you first got to know about Jean Vanier? What's what? How far back does that go for you? Well, I, you know, I knew you were going to ask that question, so I had a chance to do a little reflecting on it. Um, I realized when I read the question that uh, that I didn't, I wasn't sure about that. But I think the the answer is that uh, years ago I had a friend who worked in one of the large communities here in the United States. Um, as I recall, it was in the state of Iowa, and um, I visited that community at, at one point, um, and and I, I think it was after that, but I I, I can't be altogether sure that my my dear friend Henry Nowen, um, the the Catholic priest and and writer, I think the really spiritual virtuoso, um, went to live at the Larsh community in Toronto, which was a huge turning point in his life after, after having spent a number of years at Yale Divinity School and then at Harvard, um, at, at the Theological Seminary at Harvard, um, you know, two places where who you are um, as a human being doesn't really matter. <laughs> All that matters is what you can do yeah. and uh, and how well you can do it. And I think Henry really wounded by, especially by his experience at Harvard Divinity School, uh, went to live in, in the large community in Toronto. And I started hearing stories from Henry about, about this amazing community and about this wonderful man, Jean Vanier, uh, with, with whom Henry had become friends uh, when he uh, visited Jean in, in France. So between Henry and his powerful way of interpreting his experiences at large, and there's some wonderful stories that, that come out of the time he spent there, between Henry and my friend who was um, a worker resident at, at this large community in Iowa, I, I got to know um, Larch, the, the Larch International Movement, and Jean Vanier, and was especially attracted to Jean's books about, about community. Um, he has a book called Community and Growth, which, um, if it wasn't the first book I read was, uh, of his, was, was among uh, the early books that I read. And I'll, I'll always remember that um, <clears throat> he has in that book a definition of community that I've quoted many, many times since then, um, which is very simply, community is a continual act of forgiveness. Um, and I, lo I love that definition because I, I spent 11 years of my life living in an intentional community, a Quaker community called Pendle Hill. Uh, where about 80 people live a, a common life together, sharing meals and and worship and physical work and study and decision making and a lot of other stuff. And uh, I just think that the, the genius uh, in sort of summing it up as in, in those words, community is a continual act of forgiveness, um, is, is a genius to be respected and admired. As soon as I read those words, I thought, this is a man who really knows what he's talking about. Uh, whereas some people who write about community, um, I think, don't know what they're talking about because they haven't they haven't really lived it. But, um, you know, Jean Vanier in, in everything he does is both, uh, and I think this is a, one of the most interesting facts about him, 
he's both a realist and an idealist. Uh, and he is both of those things, you know, in a way that transcends both of those words, uh, that, that makes you want to get rid of both of those words. Um, he, he, he's someone who sees, um, you know, ordinary, everyday struggles and hard realities as somehow uh, infused with the possibility of, of holiness, of, of the sacred, um, in, a, in a profoundly humanistic sense. Uh, it's not, it's not mystical woo-woo stuff. It's it's really about about love and about how we are uh, with one another. I, I should I should add something that that it's interesting that I haven't mentioned this yet, but I think it's telling as well. I've never actually met Jean Vanier, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I feel as if. I know him, and I and I think he's one of those people uh, of whom hundreds of thousands of folks would say the same thing. I feel as if I know him because there's something about his his heart, his his true self that comes through in everything he writes and everything he says and and everything he does, and it's so consistent that you feel like this, this man is an old friend. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, I think th that um, he's been a, a, a constant companion for me um, over in, in, during the, the past, I don't know, 50 of my um, 75 years. And I'm very, very grateful for that fact. Yeah, I was just reflecting on on a similar experience. It was a it was a Massey lectures uh, that he did in 1998 on CBC. That uh, and what was, what struck me was after listening to those lectures was, um, yeah, how much I felt I knew this man all of a sudden. And, and I think it was maybe the vulnerability and the directness of his speaking and writing mm -hmm. that, that moved me and. Um, you know, there's that phrase, you know, um, he who has no guile, you know, uh, there's no, no games being played. It's right. just someone who's very curious and filled with wonder about the human experience and, and his own experience and, and is able to somehow, in very simple language, describe that. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I, I agree completely. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions I wrote you, Parker, was uh, what questions arise from you when you read John's writings. Um, what what questions do you hold from reading him? Oh, you know, I think I think the the big one is um, uh, how how does he manage to be this way in the world? <laughs> <laughs> and and implicit in that, of course, is is my own observation of myself and how often I fall short of. The, the way of being in the world that he not only advocates in his writing, but actually lives um, in his daily life. So, you know, that's a, that's a huge question. And what's interesting to me about Jean, about, about that question, is that it's a question that, that some people pose in a way that, in, in a way that, um, makes one feel judged and found wanting. Um, it's a question that, that you know, can be held in a way that uh, is so um, full of indictment and, and full of discouragement that you, 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 you don't have a snowball's chance in hell of living up, <laughs> living into that question <clears throat> because you, you start in a deficit position but um, with with Jean Vanier, with the way he poses that the question, um, I always feel this this sense of possibility in myself, and I think that's one of his of his great gifts. It's it's like it's like yes, I'm not there yet, but I'm moving in that direction, and I. 
I could get there someday if, if I pay attention. Uh, I think, you know, I think the, the very simple, his very simple secret is that he really does love everybody, <laughs> in, including those of us who aspire um, to be in the world as he is, but who haven't quite got it yet, um, or who may be, you know, living at considerable distance from this from this vision. So he, again, he sees the essential humanity in in everyone, including uh, people like me, who are inspired, but but who know that they fall short. So that's that's the first immediate existential question that that I'm holding uh, because of of what I know about Jean Vanier um, and his and his work. Um, you know, obviously from from there um, I go to to other kinds of questions, which is which have to do with what are the ways in which we might. Um, kind of help people um, be with each other uh, in, in, in this uh, accepting, affirming way. Um, what are the ways in which that are within my reach that I might um, help others, whether, whether they have um, mental or physical uh, developmental challenges or not, um, you know, we're all we're all developmentally challenged in one way or another. Um, and uh, how, how is it that I might help myself and and those that I come in contact with on a daily basis to to live into this human possibility that Jean Vanier keeps um, holding up before us? Um, and I, I think, in, in you know, part of my answer to that, Dan, has been in, in this work that, that you and I share, the, the work of the Center for Courage and Renewal, the work we do in circles of trust, um, the work uh, that's been going on for 20 years now, um, that, in, that in which we try to assist people in the helping professions in rejoining soul and role, in, in bringing their own identity and integrity um, more fully into their professional and public lives. Or to put it very simply, the work that, that for me at least, is, is based on the, on the very simple notion that, that what every human soul most yearns for is uh, that deep bow from another, the, the deep bow that says, I see you, I hear you, I honor you, um, I, I respect you, um, you are an important part of my reality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that does that not just once or twice in a lifetime, but on a regular basis. I mean, I think ultimately that's, that's what students need from their teachers, that's what colleagues need from each other, that's what people in a relationship, um, a meaningful relationship, a committed relationship want and hope for from each other, that's what people in congregations mm -hmm. yearn, yearn to have. Um, you, wherever people are, that it's the, the, the soul is, is yearning for that deep bow from another or from others. So, you know, so I've been holding those kinds of questions for a long time and, and ho trying to hold them in a way that um, allows me and, and the work I do to, to live more deeply into them. One of the, um, one of the tensions, you, you mentioned the one between reality and idealism uh, and how uh, Jean's writings kind of stay in this place of tension between them or, or can hold hold both of them. The other one I've been thinking a lot about is um, his his language. Your language in your books uh, is around. You often use the word solitude and community 
And he uses uh, the word belonging. And in belonging, he seems to be able to hold both solitude and community uh, just in the in the single word. And I, I don't know, wanted to know if you want to reflect more on that tension that you've, you sense in his, not just his books, but also in L'Arche itself as a, as a uh, human experiment in truth, right? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think Jean Vanier has known or understood for a long time that we, we ourselves need to have our own need for belonging met uh, in order to include others in a, in a sense of belonging, in order to extend that to others. So, you know, we have to, at some level, we have to belong to ourselves. Uh, from a religious perspective, we have to know that we belong to God. Um, I think th that language works to describe uh, my friend who, who, who ha had a daughter with a developmental disability. Um, she knew that, that her daughter was a child of God. Um, and, and that simple fact trumped the 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 fact that that her daughter would would never get an education you know would never be able to hold a conventional job would never be a quote success in worldly terms so there's this there's this fundamental need for belonging that that we all have to meet for ourselves and within ourselves in, in order to reach out to others in a, in a way that, that creates a larger sense of belonging, which, which, um, uh, which we frequently name as community. Um, so I, I, think, I, I think you're right, Dan, that, that there's a sense in which my language of solitude and community and the single word that Jean uses, belonging, can 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 serve as you know they do a dance of some sort with each other, um, but I also think that um, that it, that it's important to um, it's important to acknowledge the, the 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 necessity and the power of solitude in our in our lives. Um, as I've written somewhere, I don't think solitude simply means being alone. I, I think it means the capacity to be with yourself wherever you are, whether you're in a monastic cell or in a crowd, um, the capacity to be fully present to yourself. Um, it, you know, it... it Solitude, I'm thinking at, at the moment about Henry Nouwen, if, if we can loop back to him for a minute. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that Jean has observed so honestly and touchingly about Henry, which was something that, that I observed as well in the many years of our friendship, was that Henry had a very hard time being alone. Um, he, Henry w was was desperate, really, for friendship, for relationship, um, and um, Jean talks in a in an interview that I saw recently. Um, I think you may have seen this, Dan, the one he did yes. for the work of the people. Yeah. Um, he, he, if you haven't, I strongly recommend it. Um, he's asked about his friendship with with Henry Nouwen, and he said, well, you know, friendship meant meant two very different things to Henry and me. To Henry, it meant that I should be available to him at any hour of the day or night <laughs> yeah. when he had a need. Yeah. And uh, I laughed when I, when, I, when I heard that because that was absolutely true. Um, and, and Jean Vanier goes on to talk in a very loving manner about, about the the, re the, the reality in Henry's life that, that out of this sort of deep loneliness came this powerful writing. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, you know, life 
and the spiritual life, these are very complicated matters, and one doesn't want to oversimplify anything. It's, it's Henry wrote about, or he revived the concept of the wounded healer, and a lot of the healing in Henry's writing comes directly out of his own woundedness. And, and one of those wounds was that Henry was, was never really able to find the relationship or the, or, or the community of relationships that, that met that profound hunger in him. Um, and, and out of that wound, he wrote, you know, very compelling things um, about, um, about our quest for community with each other and, and, and with God. Um, but I, but my point in a way is to say that, it, you know, if I had a wish for Henry's life, um, part of me is tempted to say, I wish he could have made peace with his own solitude, you know, and, and not have been so profoundly wounded, um, by the absence of that ultimately meaningful relationship. Now I realize that as I say that that um, ha that had my wish come true, he probably wouldn't have written as powerfully as he did mm -hmm. about that whole dynamic of, of belonging. Um, and, and so I, I don't want to rewrite history. I, I don't want to rob Henry of his gift, but uh, I'm trying to put my finger on why it is that I think the word belonging and those sort of um, paradoxical concepts of solitude and community sort of all need to be in play mm -hmm. as, as we think about what our lives um, require um, and what it, how it is that we want to be in relation to one another. Yeah, thanks, Parker. I, I just got one, one, one final question that we'll, we can explore together before we wrap up. Um, and that's uh, just the question about in what ways uh, do you think that uh, John has contributed to um, to the world and and like, to the betterment of things? How, what, what do you think his what do you think his contribution is or has been? Well, I you know I think it's been I think it's been huge, and I also think it's been. Um, a quiet contribution in an interesting way. He's not as famous as Henry Nouwen became. Um, he's not as famous as Bishop Tutu. He's, you know, he's not as famous as the Dalai Lama. Um, I, I think one of the reasons that I deeply admire Jean Vanier is that he has, in many ways, simply gone about work. Um, w without, you know, ever, ever asking for headlines or recognition, uh, w without ever um, having a, a big publishing company behind him promoting uh, his his writing. Dan, I've got a truck going outside my window. <laughs> yeah, I heard it. It's okay. Can you hear it? Yeah, it's not too bad, actually. <laughs> Close the <laughs> it's interesting when they when they interviewed Jean Vanier in on um, on CBC Radio for uh, for the Massey lectures. You know, it was one of those rare moments where they he didn't actually come to Canada to give a series of lectures. They they interviewed him from Charlie Brown from from France, and uh, there's trucks going by in the background. <laughs> They're talking uh -huh. to him, and birds are chirping, and it's you can hear it's actually at his house. Uh, it's pretty lovely, actually, to hear that going on. If I, if I had more birds going here, I'd get the window open. <laughs> right now, all I can hear is truck, so I'm going to yeah. close it. Right back. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's that's better. Now I can hear myself think. You get to an age where the, the truck can blot out your own <laughs> thinking process. <laughs> so, and that's where I am right now. So, anyway, um, I th I think that um, 
I, I, I so much admire the fact that Jean Vanier is, has never promoted himself. He's, he's, what he's always wanted to promote are the lives of the people that, in whose service he lives. Um, and, and he has done that. Um, he, he's not nearly as well known as he, as he should be in my estimation, but, but who is when you compare it, you know, to people who are celebrities simply because they're celebrities or professional athletes or movie stars or whatever. Um, you know, I'm, I don't get me started on that. We just, <laughs> we, have, we just have a lot of, uh, a lot of false standards about about who it is that ought to be known in in our society. Um, but his his contribution has been that of the steady witness of of the faithful person who has never never deviated from his sense of calling um, and has found something I think early on in life that was so integral to his own soul um, that, that he, he simply, he, he's, he's always done what he couldn't not do. Um, and he's just done it persistently and faithfully. And, and, and in that way, I think, has, has, has won the affection and the respect and the admiration of everybody who knows anything about him and his work. Um, I, I really can't, I mean, I, there are certainly people who's, a lot of people who's, whose work I respect, who, whom I respect as human beings, but I, I, can't, I can't think of anyone I respect more than I respect uh, Jean Vanier um, and, and, and his, his work. So, I think his his contribution to the world has been, you know, the the almost impossible task of lifting up those who are again the the least among us, to use that that biblical phrase, and telling us time and time again in in the in the simplest and most straightforward and most fully embodied ways. Um, we're all in this together. We're no different from from one another, um, and and we all have, um, to quote the name of the new book one more time, we all have tears of silence. Um, we're all, you know, weeping over some some loss or some sense of not being seen or received um, or respected for. Or who we are, um, and and it's a, such a s simple gift, really, to to give each other, and and when we give it to another, we give it to ourselves. I think that's part of the the gift exchange that is that is always such a miracle. You when you give it away, you you get it back, and there's there's so much woundedness in the world that that can be. That can be healed by reaching out to heal other people's wounds. So you know these are all things that I think I've I've learned from Jean Vanier and his writing and his and the large communities um, more than I you know more powerfully uh, than I've learned them uh, anywhere anywhere else. And and in my mind that's that's huge. You know that's that's worthy of a of a Nobel Prize right there. Well, thanks, Parker. It's been great to uh, to, to talk together. And what I'll do for you is, uh, um, out of this experiment this summer with, with these folks that are coming, we're going to be uh, listening to some interviews with John, uh, listening to some interviews with you, and then also uh, some of your writings, some of John's writings, and, and um, just kind of entering into the ways in which you have both talked about community, about uh, society, about the individual, and then um, out of all that, though, I'll I'll, um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll type together some reflections for you just, just as a gift to give back to you. Like what, what the group has been talked about, what we discovered together. Um, it's good. I'm looking forward to that. It's, a, it's something really rich about bringing two, two, um, different, uh, reflectors together and, and see in which ways they shed light on each other. So I'm, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to, to be in John's company. Uh, abs absolutely. Henry's as, as well. Yeah, so thanks for doing that, Dan. And yeah. blessings on your work and your life and your family. Thanks, Parker.